Hello, the objective of this lecture is to introduce the different philosophical design approaches that are used in the design of civil and architectural engineering structures and to provide some background about the reliability basis of the load and resistance factor design philosophy. Let's get started. There are many different approaches to the structural design. Uh, three primary ones uh, are allowable stress design, load factor design, and load and resistance factor design. I would say that uh, of those, uh, allowable stress design was probably the oldest or the, one of the, the first um, approaches for structural design. And uh, load and resistance factor design is probably the most prevalent at this point. Um, there are other approaches that are available. You could design by plastic design, performance-based design, or using post-design evaluation. But uh, I would consider those to be um, secondary to uh, the primary methods that are shown here. We'll talk about those a little bit towards the end of this uh, lecture. Okay, allowable stress design is probably the oldest, uh, maybe the simplest of the methodologies that we'll talk about. And for safety, we have the equation that little f has to be less than or equal to f sub a. So little f is the stress in a member due to the applied loads. Um, we would use a lowercase sigma in a lot of cases, but uh, uh, lowercase f is used because old typewriters didn't have Greek letters on them. And then the allowable stress is typically calculated by uh, dividing a limiting stress, uh, f sub y in this case, by a factor of safety. That limiting stress could be based on yielding, f sub y, could be based on uh, fracture, f sub u, or it could be based on buckling, where you put an F critical in there, F sub CR. And the factors of safety would vary from anywhere between uh, 1.5 to 5 thirds, all the way up to two, or maybe even something higher than that, depending on the situation. Uh, in terms of bending moment, then the equation would be that the sum of the moments that are applied to the section divided by the section modulus um, must be less than or equal to the yield stress divided by 5 thirds. Five thirds is a common re, uh, factor of safety in the design of steel structures. Allowable stress design doesn't recognize the different variabilities of the loads that are applied or the variability of the resistance that the members have. Um, and that's a significant limitation to the use of allowable stress design. But I will say that allowable stress design is uh, a simple uh, method to use. And it has one advantage in that uh, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at a member in a uh, one-story CVS type of a building or whether you're looking at a member in a 100-story skyscraper, the stress that's in the member is going to be within the same range. It should be in the range of somewhere around uh, 15 to 30 KSI. Um, but the forces that you're using in those members, they could vary anywhere from, say, 50 kips all the way up to 500 or 5,000 kips. So um, working with stresses is uh, a bit more intuitive to most people than working with forces. So that's one of the advantages of allowable stress design. And then um, the one specification that you might work with as a civil engineer that still uses allowable stress design is the um, railway specification. It's uh, been the slowest to adopt um, more modern design approaches. Okay, and then uh, the second one is load factor design. And for safety, we have to make sure that the sum of gamma times Q is less than or equal to R sub N. In this case, uh, gamma is a load factor. Uh, Q is a member force due to the applied loads. And um, R sub N is a nominal member resistance. Okay, if we put that in terms of bending moment, what we do is we separate out the dead load moment, the live load moment, and we apply different load factors to those different actions, right? Uh, so the idea is that dead load is going to be more predictable than live load, for instance. And we would make sure that the sum of those moments is less than or equal to the moment capacity of the member. Now, load factor design is an improvement over allowable stress design, but it doesn't recognize the variability of the loads and the resistances at the same time. It still recognizes them separately, which is a shortcoming. Um, none of our major specifications use load factor design at this point. Um, the last one really to do so was the old AASHTO standard specification, which was based on allowable stress design, but it did have a load factor design alternate in one of the appendices. Okay, finally, we get to the load and resistance factor design philosophy. And for safety, the equation 
is the sum of gamma times Q must be less than or equal to phi times R sub N. So Q is the member force due to the applied loads. Uh, gamma is a load factor. R sub N is a nominal member resistance. Uh, and uh, phi is a resistance factor. So the advantage of load and resistance factor design is that it provides a more uniform, systematic, and rational approach to the select selection of load factors and resistance factors than LFD does. And just about all of the major design specifications that you're going to use for civil and architectural engineering structures are based on load and resistance factor design. So here we're showing the concrete design spec ACI 318, the steel design specification AISC 341, and <clears throat> excuse me, the bridge design specification uh, by Ashto. Okay, to illustrate the principles of uh, load and resistance factor design, Let's take a, a sample set of data. Suppose that we take 100 students and we put them all on scales and we measure their weights. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to bin the data that we get. So instead of recording everybody's weight out to four significant figures, we're just going to check the boxes uh, like this. So we say that there's one person that has a weight that's between uh, 86 and 95 pounds. There are two people that weigh between uh, 100 and uh, I'm sorry, 105 and 115 pounds, et cetera, et cetera. On average, the, the students weigh 180 pounds and the standard deviation would be 38 pounds. Okay, we can represent that data a little bit differently. We'll plot it first as a histogram where each one of these bars represents the number of instances in a particular group. So the one student that weighed between uh, 86 and 95 pounds is in this bar here. The two students that weighed between um, 105 and 115 pounds is right there. So this uh, is called a histogram and it represents graphically the uh, data, the bin data that we had on the previous slide. So this is more useful, but uh, a more useful yet of way of presenting this data is to fit a curve to it, and we can call that a probability density function of Q. So that is a continuous curve. Um, it's not a perfect representation of the data, but it is a statistically uh, useful representation of the data. So then we make the histogram go away, and we work with this bell-shaped curve as a representation of the uh, weight of 100 students that are in a hypothetical class. Okay, next, suppose that we want to measure the strength of 100 ropes. Maybe this class is going rock climbing. So we take uh, 100 different ropes into our laboratory, put them in a test machine, and we pull on them until they break. And again, we bin the data. So we have one rope that failed somewhere between 246 and 255 pounds. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have one rope that failed between 395 and 405 pounds. So on average, we have uh, a strength of 320 pounds for our ropes, and the standard deviation of the strength is 28 pounds. So what we'll do now is plot that uh, rope strength as a histogram, much like we did before. And one thing that you might note, it's not by mistake, is that the, uh, uh, the curve here is a little bit tighter. Um, right? And it has a peak that is a bit more sharp. And that's characteristic when you look at the data of a strength or a resistance of a component relative to the data associated with loads. What that means is that the strength is a bit more predictable, less variable. And uh, if you look at the load curve that was a bit wider, that means that it is a bit more variable. It has a, a, it's a little bit more challenging to predict it, for example. Anyways, what we'll do is we'll take this histogram for resistance, we'll fit a probability density function to it, just like we did for strength, and then we'll work with that probability density function instead of working with the histogram. Okay, so the next step is to plot both the probability density function for the load, Q, next to the probability density function for the resistance, R. And here you can really see the different shapes of these curves. They both uh, PDFs represent 100 samples, but the PDF for Q is uh, a little bit wider than the PDF for R, indicating that the load data is a bit more variable than the resistance data. 
So if we look at the averages here, on average, the, uh, the students weigh about 100 and 180 pounds each. And on average, the ropes have a strength of 320 pounds. So if we take this class of 100 students rock climbing and everybody just grabs a random rope, then on average, everybody should be fine, right? The strength is on average, um, what, 140 pounds stronger than the weight that should be applied to them. However, it is possible for the heaviest student in the class to select the rope that has the least strength. And in that case, you might have a load that is greater than the strength. And that repre that's represented by the overlap of the two curves. And that region that's highlighted in red now represents the possibility for there to be a failure. In other words, probably everybody is going to be safe, but it is statistically possible for the heaviest person in the class to grab the weakest rope. And that would represent a prob uh, statistically small chance of failure. So the trick for us is to figure out how to make that probability of failure small enough that we can uh, tolerate it as a society. So what we're going to do on this slide is plot a single probability density function, the PDF of R minus Q. So in this case, when R minus Q is positive, that means that R is greater than Q. The resistance is greater than our load and everything is safe. On the other hand, when R minus Q is negative, that means that Q is larger than R. That means that the load is larger than the resistance, and that correlates to a structural failure. So if we look at some of the statistics associated with this curve, we have uh, the mean value that goes through the peak of the curve, and um, we can define some quantities down here on the axis. The value sigma is a standard deviation of the data that we have R minus Q. And then the value beta is referred to as a reliability index. So what we can do is we can calculate sigma, the standard deviation of our data, and then we can set beta so that that's the number of standard deviations of the mean away from the vertical axis. By setting beta as our independent design parameter, in, uh, we can control the probability of failure that we would have for our structure or for our components. Now, setting a value of beta is uh, fundamentally a more rational approach to the design of structures than setting a value of the factor of safety, for example. Okay, this slide gives an indication of what the standard deviation is for a normal probability distribution. So if we look at uh, this, this means that, uh, let's see, one standard deviation of data includes 68.2% of the data, and that would mean that we were excluding 15% 15 15.9% uh, below. If we took instead and looked at two standard deviations of data, that would include 97.7%, and that would mean that 2.28% uh, of the data would be excluded below that value. So what this correlates to is we can uh, develop a relationship between the reliability index beta and the probability of failure, P sub F. So if we set beta equal to one, that would mean that we would have a probability of failure of 15.9%. On the other hand, if we set beta equal to 3.5, then we would have a probability of failure of 0.0233%. So the trick for us as structural engineers is to balance the cost of the structure with the probability of failure of the structure, right? If cost was no issue, then we would set beta equal to something ridiculous like 10, and there would be almost zero chance of failure. But the problem with that is that you would end up with columns in CVS type buildings that are three feet in diameter and it's just not practical. We can spend millions and millions of dollars for safety, but uh, you know we do have to balance at some point the cost of the structure with the safety associated with that structure. So if you dig into the codes and the specifications, it's challenging to figure out what the value of beta is that each are based on. Um, this slide shows some target reliabilities for performance-based design that are included in the ASCE 7 standard. Uh, 
So this isn't directly related to load and resistance factor design, but one might infer that if these are the target reliabilities for performance-based design, that the values uh, that are used for load and resistance factor design must be similar. And uh, I'm going to at least go with that, uh, that inference. So the, what's shown here on the left are different types of failures that you might expect or might guard against in the design of the structure. So on the first line, you have a failure that is not sudden and does not lead to widespread damage. On the second line, you have one that's uh, a failure that's either sudden or leads to widespread spread damage in the structure. And then in the third row, you have a failure that is sudden and results in widespread collapse. So the idea there is that you go from the most desirable type of failure, the one with the lowest consequences, down uh, to the third row where you have the least desirable type of failure, one where you have no warning and it's going to cause almost a total collapse of the structure. So we want to guard against the that that last type of failure more than we do about the more than we need to for the first type of failure. If it's a localized failure, something that doesn't happen very fast and doesn't lead to a collapse of the structure, we don't need to guard against it as much. If it's going to lead to a total collapse of the structure, then we we need to guard against it more. Then also we're looking at the risk categories here, right? So these are buildings uh, in risk categories one through four, where four is an essential facility, um, where two is our office building, one is a grain silo, right? So if we're looking at a hospital structure, we wanna make sure that when we're looking at types of failures that are gonna lead to collapse of the structure, we're gonna use a higher value of beta, four and a half. If we're looking at an office building, where we uh, are looking at just the failure of uh, one member, a localized type of failure, then maybe we could get by with a beta value equal to 3.0. So this slide shows the probabilities of failure associated with each of the reliability indices that were on the previous slide. Now these probabilities of failure have been annualized, meaning that they are uh, a probability of failure for e each year. Now, um, look at how small some of these values are. Uh, for example, if we look at a Category 2 building and look at a uh, localized failure, then we end up with a 0.003% chance of failure in any given year. On the other hand, if we look at a Category 2 building and look at a widespread failure or a collapse, then we're looking at a probability of failure that is, uh, see, 0.0007% chance of failure in any given year. So that's pretty small. Um, and then if we look at a Category 4 building, um, and we're dealing with a, a, a probability of failure that's even smaller. I think I got this right. 0.00001% uh, chance of failure in any year. Now it bears mentioning that each one, uh, these probabilities of failure and the reliability indices on the previous slide don't include things like earthquakes, tsunamis, tsunamis uh, or extraordinary events. Okay, the table on this slide uh, shows the uh, target reliabilities for uh, earthquake uh, events. And so this is uh, for a maximum considered earthquake, which is basically uh, an earthquake that uh, has a mean recurrence interval of 2,500 years. And we'll come back and talk about that at the end of this lecture, but basically it's the mother of all earthquakes. So if you look at the different categories of buildings for risk category one and two building, for a uh, non-critical member, we're looking at a 25% chance of failure per event. Um, if we look at a risk category four building, for instance, we're looking at a chance of failure or collapse of the building of two and a half percent per earthquake or per maximum considered earthquake. So these are a lot higher, but they're still relatively small. Um, and it just goes to the fundamental philosophy of design in that uh, when we look at uh, performance of a building on a day-to-day -day basis, we shouldn't have any buildings failing under normal snow loads, rain loads, uh, live dead loads, or even under uh, routine wind events. But we're willing to tolerate the failure of a significant number of buildings under earthquakes, right? A maximum considered earthquake. Now, why is that? Well, uh, two, two things, really. I mean, this is a maximum considered earthquake, so it's an earthquake that's going to occur every 2,500 years. So the odds of it occurring during the life of the structure are fairly small. 
Uh, moreover, uh, it's again a balance between cost and uh, consequences, right? If we designed every building to resist an earthquake that probably won't ever happen, then the cost of the structures would just be so high as so as to be prohibitive. All right, so when it comes down to this, uh, why is load and resistance factor design better than allowable stress design? Well, fundamentally, um, there's a misconception that a lot of people have, or at least they used to have when LRFD was, was introduced. The misconception is that LRFD will provide a cheaper design. That's what people thought was the driving reason to go to LRFD. The truth, uh, the truth is that LRFD will result in a more uniform level of safety in the design. Uh, if you tell somebody that you're using a factor of safety of five thirds or 2.0, you really don't have any idea what the uh, probability of failure associated with those factors of safety is or are. On the other hand, if you tell somebody you're using a, a load factors and resistance factors that are based on a reliability index of 4.5, you can trace back at least loosely to the probability of failure associated with that. So that's why uh, LRFD is superior in most people's opinions to uh, allowable stress design. As a measure of that, um, some uh, researchers, Chen and Duan, uh, went and looked at the reliability inherent in bridges that were designed using allowable stress design approaches or load factor design approaches. And they found that the inherent reliability was somewhat variable, uh, ranged from between one and a half all the way up to about four and a half. And it was also a function of the span length of the structure. When they went back and looked at the reliability of bridges that were designed using load and resistance factor design, they found that the reliability of the bridges was much more uniform. The, the bars aren't nearly as high and it was much more uh, evenly distributed over the span lengths for the structure. So you got a more uniform design, a more balanced level of safety in those structures using LRFD than you did using ASD. All right, now so some, so some of the other approaches that people uh, have used or can use. Uh, plastic design is probably uh, uh, an almost an outdated approach now. It's still used in seismic design at, uh, to some extent. It's basically a method of designing uh, beams and frames to develop a collapse mechanism in the, in the structure. Uh, and uh, the, the, the approach is known as plastic design because of the uh, stress strain curve for uh, steel. So if we look at this region of the stress strain curve, that's the elastic region. And if we get past the yield point into that region there, that's the plastic uh, region of the steel, the yield plateau. So when we design for plastic design, then our structures are getting into that plastic region of the stress strain curve. So that's why it's called plastic design. Performance-based design is uh, something that's just starting to come into vogue now. And the idea with performance-based design is that rather than going to a specification where it says that each member has to satisfy the sum of gamma Q less than or equal to phi times R sub N, you go in and, and set different design criteria for the structure. Uh, maybe as an owner, you would say that uh, under a normal, uh, uh, let's say under a uh, an earthquake that has uh, five point five on the Richter scale, I don't want any more than $400,000 worth of damage to my structure, uh, something like that. So what you do is you develop objective performance criteria that might include different damage states for the structural elements, for the architectural elements like uh, windows and lighting and things like that, mechanical and uh, possible damage to the contents of the structure. And after you, de after you develop those criteria, you uh, figure out what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, and you try and size the structural elements or the performance of the system based on that criteria. Okay, and the last one uh, that I'll mention here is uh, called post-design evaluation. And this is basically a process that somebody that already has a building would use to assess it for risk associated with current design specifications. So suppose, you, uh, suppose you're an owner of a building that was uh, constructed back in the 1970s. The design specifications back then aren't as 
weren't as robust as they are now. We didn't have as good an understanding of seismic behavior then as we do now. So maybe now you would want to have your 1970s structure evaluated using uh, 2020 uh, technology. And what you would do is a post-design evaluation of that structure. All right, I'm going to close this lecture by talking about some uh, more statistics associated with loads. And I'm going to define three or four terms. The first one is an ar arbitrary point in time loading, an APTL. This is the load that can be expected to be on a member at any arbitrary point in time. In other words, it's the average magnitude of the load on any random day in the life of the structure. The next term that we define is the maximum lifetime load. And this is the largest load that could be expected on a structure or in a member of a structure during the life of the structure. Now, um, as far as ASCE is concerned, buildings are designed for a 50 year service life. Now, certainly there are a lot of buildings out there that are older than 50 years. And if you look at bridges, Ashto defines a service life as 75 years. But anyways, we define 50 years as our, our life. So a maximum lifetime load is the maximum load that can be expected over a 50 year period. And then we define the term, the maximum considered load or the MCL. This is the largest load that could be expected ever. And uh, forever in this context is defined as a period of 20, uh, 2,500 years. All right, now the last term that I'll define is the uh, mean recurrence interval. And this is the average time between occurrences of a random variable. So let's suppose that we define our, uh, our random event as an earthquake with a magnitude eight. Uh, so that's magnitude eight on the Richter scale. Um, what is the, uh, how long is it going to be between each of those events at a given point? So um, that would be the mean recurrence interval. If you think it's going to be, say, 1,500 years uh, in between uh, magnitude 8 earthquakes in any given location, then the mean recurrence interval would be uh, 1,500 years. So that goes back to the idea of a 50-year storm or a 100-year storm, right? So um, that's what a mean recurrence interval is. Now, the uh, probability that an MRI value will be exceeded in any occurrence can be calculated as one over the MRI, one over the mean recurrence interval. So for a maximum lifetime load, you would say uh, one over 50 years is 0.02 or 2%. So that means that a maximum lifetime load has a 2% chance of being exceeded each year. So if we talk about a 50-year a uh, rain or a 50-year storm, then uh, in any given year, there's a 2% chance that that 50-year uh, storm will be exceeded. On the other hand, if we're talking about a maximum considered load, then the probability that that's going to be exceeded is going to be 1 over 2,500 or 0.0004 or 0.04%. That means that the maximum considered load has a 0.04% chance of being exceeded each year. Or another way of looking at that is that this is roughly a 2% chance of being exceeded in 50 years. So when we look at the design of our uh, structures, we talk about uh, a 50 year mean recurrence interval on some uh, loads. We talk about a 2,500 uh, year mean recurrence interval on other loads. And we talk about the arbitrary point in time uh, value of, of uh, still other loads. So wanna, if we want to map between these, we could say that the maximum lifetime load is approximately equal to 1.6 times the arbitrary point in time load. Or going the other way, we could say the arbitrary point in time load is about two thirds of the maximum lifetime load. On the other hand, the maximum considered load is about 1.6 times the maximum lifetime load or the maximum lifetime load is about two thirds of the maximum considered load. Now, yes, this is rough math, but it's statistics anyway. So everything is just, uh, you know, uh, approximate anyways. I suppose if I said that to a statistician, they would probably cringe, but um, be that as it may. Okay, so if we look at uh, the weight of 100 students again, um, recall that we had an average value of 180 pounds. So if we were designing, we would say that the arbitrary point in time load is basically the average value of our student weight or about 180 pounds. If we want to calculate the maximum lifetime load, uh, 
then that would be about 288 pounds. So remember the largest uh, student or the heaviest student in the room, I think uh, weighed what, somewhere around uh, 300 and some pounds. So the maximum considered load would be 460 pounds. So that gives you an indication of what these three load levels are like. So you have the arbitrary point in time load, the maximum lifetime load, and the maximum considered loads. So when we look at the loads as uh, ASCE7 presents them, we have uh, these main loads, dead, live, roof live. We have the snow load, the rain load, the wind load, and the earthquake loads. When you calculate these loads per ASCE7 uh, standards, the first uh, four or five are calculated as arbitrary point in time loads. So if we calculate the live load or the dead load that's on the structure, you're typically calculating the load levels that you would expect on any given day. Um, on the other hand, when you look at the wind load or the earthquake load that you're calculating, you're calculating the maximum lifetime load that you would expect for your structure. So that's important to bear in mind when we uh, move into our next conversation about load combinations. I don't know who to credit for the cartoons on this slide. I've seen them in many different places online but I think they do a good job of illustrating the major components of risk, the likelihood of an event happening, i.e. the probability of occurrence, and the consequences of a failure should an event occur. Another way to think of it might be to consider the likelihood of an event happening versus the cost associated with the desired performance during that event. For example, the image in the lower right might represent the failure of a component under gravity loads. Gravity loads are applied to the structure frequently, and in general, the consequences of, consequences of a failure of a beam and column are high, in some cases possibly leading to the collapse of a, of a structure. So for this case, we design loads at their arbitrary point in time level using relatively conservative load factors so that the likelihood of damage under these loads is small. In other words, the building must be immediately functional after the gravity loads are applied. On the other hand, the image on the lower left might represent the failure of a component under a maximum considered earthquake. Since the probability of a maximum considered earthquake actually occurring during any 50 year period, roughly the expected life of most structures, is only around 2%, we are willing to accept a lower level of performance if that event actually occurs. It is acceptable for most buildings to sustain a significant amount of damage during this type of event as long as the risk to human life is small. The two images on top might represent serviceability limits, such as beam deflections and lateral drift limits for the structure. In general, the consequences of exceeding these limits are usually not severe, so as a result, we often check beam deflections under service live loads, load factors equal to one, and we check lateral drift under reduced wind loads, wind loads with a mean recurrence interval of around 10 years. Okay, that brings us to the end of this lecture. Hopefully by now you understand that the three primary methods of design are allowable stress design, load factor design, and load and resistance factor design. Also, I hope you have at least a loose understanding of the reliability basis of LRFD and uh, understand why many people consider it to be the preferred method of those three. There's a lot more to be learned about reliability. We offer a class at the undergraduate level and uh, it's called CVE 3003, Reliability, and it's required for all of our civil engineering students and is open to our architectural engineering students to take as well. We used to have an offering at the graduate level, but we haven't had the uh, opportunity to offer that class in, in several years. Anyways, uh, next lecture is on load combinations. So thanks.